Good afternoon, everybody. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are in the world, and especially on our amazing African continent. A very, very warm welcome to each of you. And thank you so much for joining us for our IZE Day. It's amazing to, to have you with us, and it's really great that we're celebrating this IZE Day together. We had the first one last year, and it's incredible to see how it's grown. In fact, what's incredible is how our IZD community has grown. This year has been a tough one for just about everybody. It's been a hard year, but it's been incredibly heartwarming to see how our IZD community has grown, has strengthened, and has really come together during this time of hardship. We've had our webinars that have been well attended. We've had an incredible conference, which was better attended than any of our previous conferences. And now we're having IZD Day with all of you joining us here. So I think it's a testament to the type of people that are educators in zoos and aquariums. We feel passionately about the animals that we care for. But more than that, we feel passionate about the people that we work with. And that's what keeps us going. I read an interesting quote earlier today that I just want to, to read to you now because I think it really epitomizes who we are as educators. Tough times never last, but tough people do. And I think that we have shown that we're tough. We will get through this, we will become stronger and we will continue to do what is most important to all of us. And that's caring for nature and caring for people. Now that's all there is for me to say. I'm going to pass on to our IZD country representative for Africa, David Masingu. David has organized all of our pre presentations for today. He has organized. David has organized everything for us today, all of our speakers. So from me, Judy Mann in Durban, I pass over to David in Uganda. David, over to you. Thank you so much, Judy Mann. Uh, my name is David Musingo, representing Africa on IZD board. Happy International Zoo Educators Day. I hope everybody is fine. As Judy has said, uh, this is a very hard time, and I'm happy that uh, we are coping up with the new normal. Some facilities have been closed, but still I want to commend the educators in Africa for coping up with this new normal. Uh, today, we are going to discuss a very important topic, and I'm happy that uh, we have many educators who have joined us. The topic is how our facilities are coping with COVID-19 pa pa pandemic in promoting conservation education. Uh, this is a very important day for us as educators, especially in Africa, because this is sharing on what we have been doing and also sharing what we plan to do in this new normal. So it is a very important day for all of us. I want to thank Kim and Francis for making this happen, but I also want to thank the Secretariat led by Nate for organizing this. I want to recognize the IZD president, Deborah Erickson, and the president-elect, Judiman, for all the support. Judiman, I want to thank you in a special way for really helping us, educators in Africa. You have been our mentor, and we have seen IZE grow in Africa. And I want to thank you in a special way. Uh, today, we just want to hear colleagues from Africa sharing with us how they are maneuvering through this difficult time. So it is a very important day. But before that, we have had a series of activities conducted throughout the, the day. Uh, some of the activities include exhibitions of what educators are doing. Some of these activities include embedding and others. And also, before we start the discussion, let the educators know that this session 
is being recorded and it will be uploaded on the social media, especially the Facebook, the Twitter and the others. So you take note of that. So I don't want to waste much time because we only have one hour. I want to welcome everybody to discuss this issue. I know quite a number of facilities have put uh, measures in place, the SOPs, the standard operating procedures, and they have opened without any problem. So we want to hear those good stories. Others are unable to go to the communities and conduct conservation education programs, but they have adopted other methods of uh, online, using the virtual approaches to reach our public, to reach our intended audience. So this is an opportunity for us to, to listen. Uh, can you all just turn your cameras on very, very quickly? And we'll take a, a quick group photo while we wait for David to return to us. Ah, now we can see that sometimes we've got two for one. And if it's really early in the morning and you're still in your pajamas, that's okay, don't worry. Okay, we'll take the first one. Okay, and we've got another what screen. Ah, oh, you're back. We're just doing a quick group photo, David, while we while we were waiting for you, we're doing a quick group photo. But I had some problem. No, no problem at all. There we go. We're just doing our photos quickly okay. on the last screen. Smile. There we go. Okay. There we go, David, back to you again. Thank you, Jude. I normally trust you whenever there's a problem you stand in. <laughs> so the, 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 the discussion is open for us to move forward, how we want to share experiences, especially on the African continent, what you are going through, what you plan to do, engaging our audiences, the public. And I'm happy that we, have now registered about 30, 53 participants. So I'm sure this discussion is going to be very interesting. Any first attempt? Okay, maybe I can ask some of our colleagues from UIC to share what they've been up to. David, sorry, but I'm going to ask for, for some of your team. I can see some of our friends there from UIC. Maybe you'd like to share some of what you've been doing. I know we saw the sanitizing. Maybe tell us a little bit about that. Can I request Eric? Eric or Philip, can you tell us? how we have managed to sail through this difficult time. Oscovia, but Jude also, we have colleagues from Kenya that are here and from other countries. We could also hear from colleagues from Johannesburg Zoo, Nazi, and also Lewa, Hi, David. Can you, can you hear me, David? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you, Nati. Yeah, uh, the, the, the challenges of COVID has, you know, affected us, you know, globally and Johannesburg Zoo has not been an exception to, to the challenges, uh, but we had, uh, you know, challenges uh, basically when this thing was right at its peak uh, during uh, the Q3 and the level three and level, level four and five, where, you know, there was a very, very few number of people that were pre-selected to to have that special privilege to come and work in terms of uh, seeing to it that the welfare and the husbandry of animals is taken care of. But then um, I think at level three, uh, the education component was called back to come back to the zoo on particular days, uh, say maybe three or four times a, a, a week. Uh, and then we, 
had uh, meetings uh, and to, uh, when we where we decided to say look um, things are not normal this is a new normal and uh, we can't just sit back and fold our arms and do absolutely nothing so we we had the uh, brainstorming sessions where we looked at other ways of inventing ourselves and making ourselves relevant to to uh, the prevailing situation then uh, we we decided to to revive the tools so that's that has been our 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 focus uh, we we organized a whole lot of sleepovers we advertised them vigorously and the public was you know responding with high enthusiasm as we speak uh, we are fully booked for the next coming three months and uh, we are almost doing these tours on on weekly basis as uh, the the economy opened uh, we managed to train uh, eco guides that would be used in the in the in the in the tour guiding or eco guiding so to speak so we we've had uh, yesterday uh, students that wrote exams and uh, we had something like 99% pass so we have eight more additional staff members that would be assisting in terms of dispensing information and knowledge based on these tours we have our evening tours uh, moonlight tours we have the sleepovers um, coupled with the upcoming uh, festival of lights that's going to be happening at the zoo. So there is a whole lot of hive of activities in terms of addressing the issues of, you know, biodiversity and educating our, our public. We've had some uh, rave uh, reviews on, on Facebook recently about how the public is responding to, to, to these tours. We're looking forward to the festive season, and we hope that uh, we might be having a full scale, you know, running on weekly basis uh, of these tours that are uh, happening in the zoo. We haven't done the daily tours. We're still assessing the situation. As soon as uh, the, the, the restrictions are lifted, because we're still allowing groups of not more than 10 people coming through the zoo. So there is this issue of social distancing. Even our afternoon tours, uh, we are taking uh, limited numbers. Like in our truck, that would normally take 20. We take 10 people so as to observe and respect the, the COVID-19 regulations. I yield back to you, Chair. David, you're muted. Oh, Nati, I want to thank you so much for sharing with us your experience, how you are coping up in this difficult time, and that you have taken us the levels that you have gone through. And definitely, we pray that things improve, and we pray for also other facilities. I think we are taking the same trend, like in my facility. We opened in phases. We have just concluded the first phase where we could allow in a maximum of 300 people per day. And now we are moving to about 500 people in the second phase. And the third phase will begin in January next year. So thank you so much for sharing. We need more experiences. We need more educators share with us what you are going through. Yes, John Potter. Thanks, David. So just to give you a little bit of background of, of what we went through during level five and level four lockdown, um, it was quite tight in South Africa. So the education team all had to work from home. And fortunately, at the beginning of the year, one of the things we had identified was the need for cross training between the different education departments and giving people experience in developing training material. So the staff were tasked and, and went away with those tasks um, just 
developing fact sheets, developing um, PowerPoint presentations on conservation issues that we could then use to share with the rest of the team. And one of our biggest challenges was that most of the education staff did not have computers at home. They had cell phones. So I am incredibly amazed at what they managed to do using a cell phone. And many of the households actually rearranged their waking hours to make sure that those working staff had time and connectivity at night to, to be able to undertake those tasks. So people got up at like 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning and worked till one o'clock in the morning. Um, and it was just amazing that they were able to do that. And they did that with a full household of people because in many instances, with the advent of lockdown, they moved parents into their homes. So you had three generations staying together um, on, because they wanted to be able to look after the parents. And then in terms of when we finally got the nod to open, um, we're very grateful for the direction that we got from zoos overseas who had already started this process. So we were actually able to use a number of their lessons. And the one lesson that, that I picked up, um, we've had it a little bit at our own facility where you put up a pretty sign. Sometimes that sign is removed and goes to somebody's home bar, their home pub. So we made, and, and that's what a number of overseas facilities said, they did lovely stickers um, about social distancing and they couldn't keep up with the number of stickers that disappeared during the day. So, so in, in all that we did, we actually piggybacked on what the supermarkets had already um, sensitized the public to what was normal in terms of social distancing um, and sanitizing and stuff like that. So we find that the number of our public um, as they get to a sanitizing station, will automatically sanitize their hands, will automatically look for directional signage, which we not had before. Um, and it's it's been an interesting learning curve to see how different public have adapted. Some public have rebelled because they don't want to be told what to do. Um, and that's, you, we all know that's human behavior and, and we adapt around that. And our team has tried really hard to stay safe within themselves, but without um, detracting from the public's experience. So we, at the moment, are not having big presentations. So we're having short presentations to ensure that there's not big gatherings uh, and, and we, we don't, um, we're not advertising activities. So as people come across the activities, they get the chance to participate. I don't know if that helps. John, thank, uh, thank you so much for, for sharing with us how you are coping up in South Africa. And we do understand, especially the challenges that you have gone through in developing those materials using lack of even computers, but you are able to develop those materials having only cell phones. So we are very grateful and we thank you so much. Uh, we welcome more. Uh, and also you talked about the support that you have got from other sister facilities and zoos. Uh, this is the family of IZE. And we appreciate all those facilities that are helping others, more especially in Africa, where we have challenges of network, where we have the challenge of power, electricity, where we have a lot of challenges here. And uh, imagine the, the work that you have gone through. So we appreciate all that that you have done. Uh, other colleagues, please share with us what you have done and how you are coping up in this difficult time. Eric, yes. Eric, did you have your hand up? Who's online? Eric, Eric, you put your hand up? Did you put it up by mistake? 
Eric? Okay, maybe maybe he didn't put his hand up. Um, who else? Eric, yes, did you want to talk? Yes, Eric. Eric, can you unmute? Please unmute. Yes, Eric. All right. Thank you very Thank you very much. Um, I'm from Uganda. I'm from Uganda Wildlife Conservation Education Center. Well, I think at the beginning, mid-March is when the entire country, Uganda, went into a lockdown. Of course, it was unprecedented. Um, some of our colleagues, majority, had to go home and um, work remotely. Uh, but one way or the other, we would not leave you know, the work un unattended to. And so we had to adjust to the new normal. We had to adjust with the technology advancements. Uh, we started uh, conducting meetings um, from home. Uh, fortunately, uh, unlike uh, my previous colleagues who talked about phones, everybody was able to get a laptop you know, and conduct the meetings from home. One thing we reopened in um, August, actually, first of August is when we reopened. And um, our education team has been able to come up with new tools of um, disseminating information, of uh, changing mindsets, uh, coming up with strategy in this new normal. And um, of course, that has been possible with the support of management. Uh, the disadvantage, yes, because the country, uh, through the Ministry of Health, uh, they have advised us to reduce on the numbers. And so some of our colleagues, the educators, uh, are still at home working with us, developing strategies. So we have a few of our educators, uh, a number about nine, nine of them, because uh, we need to uh, follow the guidelines put in place. Currently, uh, in the second phase, uh, some of our facilities are not yet open to the public because we are still following the standards put in place. Uh, for instance, our accommodation facilities, land recreation activities that support the running of our work have not yet been officially open. But what we have done every single day, our educators ensure that um, the SOPs are followed to the dot. They participate in the cleaning of high surfaces, the environment of surfaces to avoid any contamination. They ensure our visitors are follow the guidelines put in place, social distancing, uh, ensure they have masks uh, on. Of course, my mask is right beside me. And um, this has been followed effectively. And uh, fortunately, our visitors are adhering to all the guidelines put in place. Of course, uh, we had different activities and programs, uh, for instance, to mark the International Zoo Educators Day, uh, but they have not been affected because of the guidelines to avoid gatherings. We had friends from the fourth estate who wanted to join us and the public because this is home. Uganda Wildlife Conservation Educators Center is home. But we have worked remotely uh, in a scientific manner to ensure we still disseminate the information. Uh, but we are hopeful that now with the opening of the international airport and uh, the loosening of uh, the strict guidelines, we believe heading into the festive season with the optimism in place, all will be well and we shall resume and work normally. And we're looking forward to the third phase of our operations. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eric, for sharing the situation in Uganda. Exactly, that is what we are going through, and thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Please, we welcome other colleagues to share with us what you are going through and what you have managed to do and what you plan to do. David? If you'll allow yes, me to say, how are yes, you Margaret and how is everybody? 
Yes, thank yes. you. Thank you, David. Um, I would just like to share with this uh, meeting that at the Wildlife Clubs of Kenya, we have continued engaging students in various activities, including, including connecting children to nature, uh, though in a very small um, way, because uh, we can only take very uh, small numbers at a time due to social distancing requirements. Tree growing is ongoing countrywide, but most of all, we've taken this opportunity to encourage the students to read and research and uh, engage in various competitions and quizzes. Uh, for example, we are holding a countrywide uh, eco challenge quiz where the winners will face students from India. So from deep down inside the villages in Kenya, we have winners who at the end of the day will uh, face uh, winners from India. We are conducting this activity together with a service, uh, that's a uh, conservation education organization in India. Uh, we have continued to engage our members virtually and even shared resources virtually. We have held several virtual educators workshops uh, and in all our activities, we have maintained the COVID-19 containment protocols, meaning um, that um, we have made sure that uh, there is hand washing, uh, sanitizing, uh, everybody wears their masks, and we have had uh, small numbers of, of learners as compared to previously, or as uh, is our tradition. Our centers have remained closed and uh, uh, they will remain like that for a long time. Uh, the biggest disadvantage that uh, our activities, uh, we are experiencing in our current activities is that uh, this leaves out many learners who reside far from our centers and those who have no access to computers or internet connectivity. Right now, the, the bulk of the schools are open, uh, at least the grade four, uh, grade eight, and the form four. Uh, unfortunately, they are all examination classes and uh, therefore they are really involved with academic work and uh, there are no co-curriculum activities, but we are making sure that we are reaching them virtually with uh, various resources that will uh, empower them and encourage them to take action for conservation. Thank you so much, David. Thank you, Margaret, <clears throat> for sharing with us the situation in Kenya, especially the wildlife clubs of Kenya. We appreciate the good work that you are doing. Of course, the challenge that you have uh, stated, that you have mentioned, especially reaching the rural communities, very difficult. We cannot reach them through the virtual means, but at least the urban centers we are able to reach them through the virtual approaches. So the demonstration, I'm sure it's the same across Africa, but we have to see how we can sail through. Thank you so much, Margaret. Um, we are welcoming colleagues to discuss this very important topic, how our facilities are coping up in this difficult time of COVID-19 in promoting conservation education. Can we hear from Lewa? Jonathan, unmute yourself. OK, uh, how is everyone? We are fine. Yeah, um, I'd, like, I'd like to let Efantas uh, handle that, talk about Lewa and uh, what we've been doing so far, the situation here, and then I'll join in later. Hello, Fantas, can you unmute? We are not hearing you, yes. Oh, you can hear me now, I'm moving so. I hope you can hear me now. Yes, yes, we are hearing you. Yes, uh, I'm a fantas from Lewa. I just want to, to share some of the progress this year, just after COVID 
uh, came, came in. I know it was really just, just a brief about the conservation education program, which is a program that we run with Jonathan. We are a small team running the, the program. A program really has focused mainly on school groups all the way from primary high school and, um, and other tertiary institutions. And uh, when COVID struck, we lay our hand also to make a drastic decision, just like it happened to all the schools closing. So we had also to close our program and like shut everything in terms of, uh, we could not uh, reach the students, could not visit the schools and the schools could not also visit the conservancy. So for the first four months, we actually were off-site of Lewa, the team that is uh, me and Jonathan, and we had to work one-to-one -one with Jonathan for, for other issues, but technically we were not doing much as pertains the conservation education program, but uh, we resumed in, in August to really take up from where we had stopped in April, and uh, from there, we started really thinking about what can we do to be able to uh, like develop resources that we could engage the students post COVID. Because at the moment we are not looking, we are looking at things that we can do so that when the, the, the COVID gets down, we could really uh, start really engaging the, 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 the students and uh, our main audience. So since then, we have been actually in the office on and off, but uh, working on some resources that we could use when the students are back, but try also to briefly use social media to share some of the information. But uh, as Margaret has just mentioned, reaching to the students, reaching to the communities, really has been very limited. And this is because we were also trying not to be a factor that is leading to the, the acceleration of the, the, the COVID situation. So we have to really uh, look at going slow and minimize our interaction with the communities. But we still have uh, other community interactions in the organization at large. For example, human or drive conflict has been also addressed by the security team that has been here throughout, not really being affected. But uh, the, uh, the messaging on COVID-19 also has been taken up by the health the department, reaching to the communities. And at lunch, every engagement with the community by the health team, by the communities team, or by everybody in Lewa has still a message of reminding the conservancy, the communities about their responsibility to take care of nature. So the program, conservation education program specifically, has been off-site, but other engagements with the community has been done at lower scale. So that has been what we've been really doing, but uh, Jonathan can have more some information on what else we have been able to do, and you can, you can add, add, add some information about that. Thank you. Thank you, Fantas. Jonathan, do you want to supplement? Uh, yes, so Hamjambo, um, once again, and that is I am Swahili. I'm a jumbo. Uh, yes. So, uh, Ifanda has mentioned what, um, how we've been operating so far. It, it hasn't been, uh, it hasn't been easy on our side, but at least um, taking advantage of uh, platforms like the social media. At least in the meantime, we've been able to to sharpen our skills. Um, and, and explore uses of, of platforms like Canva to develop uh, materials that we can share. And also we've been able to, to produce a few videos, especially, I mean, during the uh, Vulture Awareness Day and also the World Rhino Day. So at least we were able to <clears throat> share some information, especially uh, regarding some of the challenges these species are facing here in, uh, I mean, not just in Lewa, but in, in, in Kenya and, and the world as a whole. So hopefully um, just the, the only difference is that um, we do not have that specific target audience as we usually do when uh, students visit Lewa because we work with different age groups. But now here we are just kind of um, casting 
our, our net to just uh, sharing information, hoping that uh, those out there are, are learning something. So um, that is, uh, at the moment, the, the schools that are open in Kenya are only, uh, I mean, we have the, the class eight, that is uh, grade eight, and also grade 12, that is the form four here in Kenya. But that is because they are uh, approaching the exams. They were supposed to sit uh, the exams this year the, at the end of the uh, by the end of the year, but uh, that didn't happen because of COVID. And we are now seeing another wave, so we don't know uh, what is likely to happen. So we are waiting for directive from the Ministry of Education. And in the meantime, what we can do, just like Ifant has mentioned, is to continue polishing the resources. As we um, at the moment, especially the coming months, we are also uh, partnering with um, a Canadian-based uh, organization uh, to uh, explore how we can use the virtual platforms, especially uh, like Zoom or StreamYards, to be able to stream uh, live events or education programs from Lewa. So um, we hope that maybe we'll, we'll share that with the <clears throat> IZD platform so that uh, those who would like to see what we are doing here in Lewa um the species that we have and uh, <clears throat> our education center we hope all that will be shared through the, the virtual platform so we'll be streaming live from here and um and and, and we hope that we'll uh, achieve something yes thank you very much we are grateful for the team from lewa conservancy Fantas and jonathan thank you so much for sharing definitely recommend you for the good work. I know before COVID, you had a lot of activities in the communities and schools, but uh, this has really affected you so much. But we also happy to learn that you are engaging learners through, through other means, especially virtually. So that is very great. And I'm sure other educators across the world and in Africa have listened to you. Thank you. Judy Mann. David, could I ask somebody in the audience who's with us to maybe explain what Canva is? I see a few people have said in the chat that it's the zoo educator's lifesaver. So I'm sure not everyone knows what it is. Maybe you, somebody could share with us what Canva is, please. Anybody? Who can share with us? Jonathan's hand up. Yes, John. Ah, okay. Um, thank you. So I'm willing to share because I've been uh, a big user of Canva, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, it's actually I've I've seen someone comment here. Karen, that is Canva is Zoom Educator's lifesaver. Yes, it is because uh, those of us who would like to develop materials so fast, especially the, the posters and flyers that that can be shared virtually, without really going through the extra getting a graphics designer. Uh, what happens if you go to uh, canva.com, um, <clears throat> that is www.canva.com, uh, it's straightforward. Um, yes, Alerik has shared that, the link, so canva.com is so straightforward. All you need to do, they already have pictures in the platform, but you can add your own photos, you can, for example, take a photo in, in your center or, or zoo, and then add that to the platform. And then simply change a few texts here and there. So let's say you want to share something about rhinos. Uh, all you need to do is have that the information you want to share down and then include uh, the text. So it's, it's text and images. What professional graphics designers do, but they've already given you a number of free templates. So there are so many free templates of the platform, but also some that are, are sold. You can pay an equivalent of, I mean, it, it's $1 a template, that is if you decide to go for the paid option. But otherwise, um, I've never paid a cent, but I've developed a number of resources from the, from, from the platform. So it's quite, quite, quite useful. And you can develop these resources so fast in a minute or two, and you have something to share. 
Wow, thank you so much. I must confess that I've, I've never heard about Canva. <laughs> so it's good that you have shared with us the link and the colleagues, educators take advantage of that, download and use Canva. Thank you. And Jude, thank you so much for guiding on that. <laughs> yes, we have about 18 minutes to go. So let us share more experiences, what we are going through in Africa and even beyond. We have colleagues who are not in Africa, but they have joined us. So feel free to share with us your experience during this pandemic. John, from South David, Africa. I would just add one, um, being very aware that um, many South Africans can't, our, um, our cell phones cost a fortune for data and for cell phone time. So what we've also done and the communica our communications team led by Judy have put together a number of resources that have gone onto the website. We've been developing lessons and we've made sure that the lessons when they're put together and they're on the website are in a very small file um, that you could print on an A4 page so that you don't lose um, quality, but, the, but they are small so that they're very easy and quick to download. We've also had over the lockdown time, and even now, we have parents who are having to homeschool children. Many of our schools, only half the children are at school on any one day. So somebody's looking after the kids at home. So we've put resources onto our website, children's stories with worksheets and activities that those parents can then use, and they are on conservation issues, but but fun and, and aimed at kids. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, John. Definitely the issue of data, many people cannot afford here. So when we go virtual, then some people may not participate. So we thank you for the good work that you are doing in South Africa. I encourage you to keep sending messages. We are reading them and also to participate in this discussion. I want to encourage most of you to share with us. We still have good, good minutes to go. So please, you're welcome to share with us your experience. I can see Philip. Philip has been in charge of community programs. You can share with us how you are coping. I don't know how you are engaging the community in conservation education programs, Philip. Thank you, thank you, David, and uh, uh, hi to everybody who has been able to join us uh, today to celebrate this important day. Indeed, it's been difficult for us here as it has been elsewhere. Um, one thing that, however, uh, I wish to say we have taken with us through the pandemic is that uh, we've had to learn to do things differently alternative ways of doing the things. That meant that even we've had to reflect on the programs that we're developing, but this pandemic has given us opportunity also to do some in-house reorganization. For example, um, we have uh, begun to pay a little more attention to areas we didn't have time for that, for lack of a better word, to, to pay attention to. Uh, as a matter of fact, we, we had an experience earlier this morning, for instance, uh, where we had uh, birding for the visually impaired um, and where we are role playing as educators to see how we can adapt to dealing with new situations. Um, so in, in a nutshell, the, the times of the pandemic have given us a platform and, and a reason to think differently better and, and, and prepare ourselves for whatever may come, not just the, the COVID-19 pandemic, it, because we, we deal with a, a, a diversity of clientele. 
So it's been an opportunity, difficult as it has been, that as, as you work and as educators, we have tried to reflect on how to, to try and do things differently better, develop some new programs. We have a uh, hard time to engage, engage with people, but also pretest some of the material that we have developed with the people in our communities. We, we have developed uh, some activity books for children and these we continue to um, protest um, with, with different sizes of, of audiences. So the opportunity from this for me is, is that we have been able to reorganize and see how differently better to do things. But in, in the area of uh, a community engagement and school engagement, uh, just like Jonathan and, 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 uh, has shared, that we've had to try and accelerate the development and production of, of online material. As you work, we are developing um, material to um, support the mainstream curriculum. And when this came up, we said now, the material we're developing, how can we work with it to prepare it for um, an audience that is, is, is beyond and, and very global? So uh, those are the things that we have been reflecting on and trying to work on. I thank you. Thank you, Philip. That is beautiful sharing with us. I think we, we can all agree that we are going through almost similar situation. And as Jude said at the beginning, tough times never last, but tough people do. So we, I'm sure we are going to last. And from many, discuss, from many discussants here, what they're saying is that they have taken advantage of this difficult time to develop materials. And I'm sure time is coming where we are going to interface. But there is a question that has come from Stephen, very interesting. I hope someone is able to respond to this question. Do you plan to change any of your education programs as a result of COVID and lockdown? For example, people are now using masks and the many are being thrown away. So the new issue is like plastics to tackle. Judy, I know you have been handling the issue of plastics in Africa and at global level. I hope maybe I request that you respond to this question here, Judy. Um, thank you, David. I'm not going to respond to the first part of the question because I'm sure one of our colleagues would like to share on that. On the second part, I think that that certainly is an issue that's been raised is that we now have a whole new range of single use products that are being discarded. But I think that it's taking us back to any form of single use is, is what we really need to think about. So whether it's a mask or a plastic straw, it doesn't make a lot of difference what it is, it's how we treat it. And I'd like to share with everyone the resources that we produced for WAZA, which is a guide to reducing single use plastic in your facilities and also a video that you could play in your facilities. So if anyone hasn't seen that yet, I know David has sent it to, to most people, but it is a WAZA resource um, and I can share the, the link with everybody maybe a little bit um, later on. So that is available. So to me, the answer to that is look at uh, single use items such as masks, the same way we look at any other single use item. Do we need it and how do we actually dispose of it responsibly? Um, there are wonderful masks that you can use again, you have to wash and you can use again. So it's again, educating ourselves, looking at what are we doing and then looking at what are our visitors doing and helping them to understand the implications of throwing a mask away. Thank you, George. Definitely we are going to share the video with all the participants who are participating in this session here. But before maybe allowing other people to discuss, we have some few minutes. I also wanted to say that we last year, we organized a very successful in-training workshop for Africa in Uganda, and it was very successful. Uh, this year, we had planned to have another one, but we could not because of COVID. 
and hopefully this will take place next year. So I want to invite everybody when we put this up, please apply and possibly you will be selected to come and participate. We had planned to organize one in Kenya, especially being hosted at uh, in Naivasha, Kenya. And we hopefully this will come to pass next year. So I think we have been doing well. If it was not this COVID in Africa, IZE was really taking roots. More discussions as we are about to come to the end because we have other sessions coming from other regions of this world. So within eight minutes, we shall be ending this. There are some pictures that are being shown on the screen, taking us through what activities have been taking place to celebrate this day from morning up to the, the evening. So a number of activities have, have been organized and we appreciate all the educators for the good work. Any other person, as we come to the end of this discussion, Yes, yes uh, I see Mwangi, Mr. Mwangi. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. David. Uh, I hope everyone is uh, staying positive and testing negative to these uh, very uh, tough times that we are facing as a, as a globe. Uh, my, my word is that uh, the situation back here at Kenya, especially at Olpajeta, is not... Uh, different and how we have managed to cope is that we have a virtual classroom program that uh, is up and running especially on our facebook uh, pages and what the the aim of this uh, virtual classroom uh, project is to help students understand more about extinction and more about uh, northern white rhinos that are currently that we currently have at all and they are the, the only ones that they are the only ones remaining in the whole world uh, another thing is that uh, we also have student scholarships, students that we have helped with, uh, with computers to continue studying uh, as they remain home. And I think it has gone a long way to help them, you know, catch on with their studies. And it's more of a way that to incentivize them and show them that uh, we can still do this and we can still, uh, they can still study while at home. So that has been uh, our input towards uh, towards conservation education. And something else that we are still working on is that we have several collaborations that are coming up where we are going to see to see to it that we create uh, virtual realities, more like the ones that are used in games, but more in um, on conservation issues, just to make sure that uh, people understand uh, or see the kind of world that we want them to be is more tailored towards students than the uh, grown up. So, that is how we are coping with the, the COVID situation back in our budget. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mwangi, thank you so much. Definitely, we appreciate the good work that you're doing, especially conserving the last rhino, the northern white rhino in your facility, almost now going extinct. We do appreciate the good work that yes, you're doing you. in that facility. Thank you. Yes. Susan, I can see you. Yes, William. You yes, can... uh, thank you so much, uh, David. My name is Francis William Ruhimira from Uganda Health Conservation Education Center. I just wanted to supplement on what uh, Eric has mentioned. Uh, as UEC, when we had a lockdown, we organized a virtual tour of the center. So this virtual tour was aired on our website, on all our social media, to highlight the plight that the center was going through the pandemic. So this attracted some support from good people, and it really helped us to go through uh, the pandemic. Then we, we also had, uh, we organized, most of you could have watched, the Jerusalem challenge, when we opened, to show people that we opened. So this also publicized us and it has helped to know that we are now open. Now as we are open, 
we are conducting two studies, the study that is ongoing about the impact of visitors on the activity budget of chimpanzees. We want to see uh, if the visitors have an impact on the activity budget of the chimpanzees. The other one is related to the fact that the educators are at the forefront of enforcing the SOPs in any facility. The educators interface with the visitors. So we are doing a stand on a compliance of visitors on the SOPs in place. The educators are monitoring if the visitors are wearing masks, if they are social distancing, and also the issue of waste management. Because we know that if we don't dispose of the waste, uh, especially the masks. These masks would get into the exhibits. The possibly they can transmit diseases to our animals. So that, that is part of what we've done. But we are also organizing online lessons as work, which will be on the website. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Thank you, Francis. Thank you for sharing with us. I know time is not on our side. So I want to take this opportunity, first of all, to thank you in a special way for sparing your time. And I want to invite our incoming president of IZE, Dr. Judman, to give us the closing remarks. Thank you so much, David. And a big thank you to every single one of you for being with us today, for supporting us and, and for sharing your experiences. It's been amazing to, to see what we've been able to achieve under very difficult conditions. We, as educators, thrive on sharing our love for nature with our visitors. And suddenly, the main reason we're there seems to have gone. And we've been able to find different ways to share our love and care and to support behavior change. And that's been really inspiring to, to hear what everyone said. My last word to each of you is, please look after yourselves. So often as educators, we give to others, but we forget to take care of ourselves. So my last message to all of you is, look after yourselves, give yourself a little chance to take a breath, remember why you do this, and take care because we need every single one of you and nature needs you. Thank you for all that you do. Thank you, David, for all you've done to organize this. Thank you, Kim and Francis, our team in the background. Thanks, Antoinette. Thank you, everyone who's made this happen.